guys, I'm Sai, and welcome to Ace Podcast Nation. Here on the channel, you can find podcasts, interviews, and content on a whole variety of subjects. We have ongoing series on mental health, mental health in sport, conspiracy theories, serial killer files. We also have a weekly show on championship football with former Premier League striker Andy Campbell, as well as monthly shows on MMA and films and TV, and much, much more. Uh, you can keep up to date with new guests and what's coming up on our Twitter page, which is at AceCast underscore Nation. And you can also find us on Facebook.com slash AceCast Nation. All our shows are available in video format on YouTube and audio at all the usual podcasting platforms. So today's episode is uh, in our series on mental health. In this series, we feature different mental health conditions each episode. We speak to medical professionals or people who suffer with these conditions or have been affected, whether it's family members or people themselves who've been affected, uh, to help people understand the impact of uh, these conditions have on a daily basis. I don't pretend to know a great deal about all the conditions that we we talk about and we go through on these shows. Um, I do have a little experience with uh, today's subject, which is addiction. Um, As I discussed in a previous episode, which we did on depression and grief with uh, football journalist Phil Brown, we, uh, I had some in- issues with drinking in my 20s that affected every aspect of my life, uh, especially my mental health. Um, and only really in the last kind of 10 years have I got to grips with those mental health issues myself, with depression and things like that. So I was eager to do these shows, speak to different people. Hopefully we can educate other people, people like myself as well. I can learn about different things raise awareness, break down stigmas, and most of all, and hopefully we can reach people who may be struggling at the moment with whether it's addiction today or the other conditions that we speak about on the various shows and the shows that we've got coming up. Uh, so today's episode, like I mentioned, is on addiction. D- addiction comes in many forms and uh, affects all sorts of people in different ways. Uh, today I'm joined by the author of the book, The Addiction That Nobody Will Talk About, writer, addiction expert, and himself a recovering addict, Mr. Joshua Shea. Welcome, uh, Joshua. How are you? Thank you very much for having me on today, Si. I'm doing great. Cool. Yeah, no, it's going to be uh, it's going to be an interesting chat. I, um, yeah, I, it's, it's always tricky when you're doing like a podcast on mental health because it's, you know, some of the things you talk about can be emotional. They can be a bit sort of private and whatnot, personal, but I feel like the best way to raise awareness with mental health and help each other and people is to talk about it. Because if I feel like mental health problems only get worse if you don't discuss it, whether you discuss it with friends, family, doctors, whoever it may be, you need to, or strangers. I find sometimes I find it easier to talk to someone completely removed from my life who I've never spoken to before than I do in the book like I have done to speak to you know people closer in my life is it's weird when that well that's why I love doing podcasts <laughs> yeah that's it isn't it it's, it's easier to discuss stuff with people who are not involved or have got no sort of bearing um <clears throat> so just uh, I wanted to start just before I start bombarding you with questions and we hear a bit about the kind of your story um I came across I think it was like a book website and it was just a kind of little paragraph basically about your book um and i just thought it was quite interesting to read to the listeners viewers just to get an idea of sort of where we are because um so it says uh, joshua shea seemingly had it all a loving wife two children and a supportive extended family in 2010 after nearly 15 years working his way up the journalism ladder he launched a lifestyle magazine in his hometown Within a year, he was one of the founders of the Central Maine's largest film festival and had won a seat on the city council in Auburn, uh, Maine. Accolades including receiving the key to the city and being called one of the next 10 people shaping Maine's economy by a state newspaper followed. Um, So the reason I wanted to read that is because obviously we're going to get into all the ins and outs of what you've been through. you know, you're, you had what some people would perceive as everything, a good job, good career, um, well-respected, a wife, children. On paper, things were going very well. 
Yeah, ab absolutely. I think that uh, when you think of the American dream, as we tend to call it over here, um, from the outside looking in, I think most people would say that I had that. I worked my way up. I worked hard. I was a very active member of my community. Um, you know, that, like I said, somebody who, who wasn't living my life on the inside uh, saw a very successful happy you know well-liked well-respected person yeah and i think um i think all addicts particularly addicts but also people with mental health issues become very very good at hiding uh whether it's what's bothering them or their illness or their addiction um so like you say people on the outside they they wouldn't have realized that perhaps you were having uh, the issues that you were having um and the other reason I wanted to sort of read that was because, you know, addiction, sometimes I feel like people uh, think that addicts, they think of drug addicts, you know, in a, like an alley taking drugs or injecting drugs or, you know, whatever it may be, or, or like smoking crack or smoking meth and like being like this sort of uh, seedy underbelly of like, it's only criminals who are addicts and it's not. It can happen to anyone, same as very similar to, you know, to mental health it can happen to anyone. Doesn't um, it doesn't discriminate between, you know, rich and poor, white or black, male or female. It can happen to anyone. Um, so let's get into to you, as it were. Um, if we just start, we'll just sort of get to know you and uh, whatnot. So. Where, you know, what was your kind of childhood like and, you know, where did you grow up, siblings, things like that? Uh, I grew up in uh, central Maine. Uh, for anybody who happens to be in Europe uh, that doesn't know about that, it's about six hours north of New York City, uh, about three hours north of uh, Boston. Uh, and it's a very rural kind of state. I actually live in the second uh, largest city, and that's only 40,000 people. Um, okay. So, you know, not, not, not a uh, big city kind of place. Um, I had a pretty good upbringing, uh, all things considered. Uh, my parents were both the children of alcoholics, so they didn't drink a drop. There was no alcohol in my house when I was a kid. Uh, there was no pornography in my house. There was no drugs in my house. My parents didn't gamble. Um, you know, they were very, I'm not going to say over the top conservative because I think that they were somewhat socially liberal. Uh, they were both elementary school teachers. I think my dad taught 12 year olds. My mom taught six year olds. Um, it was a very, uh, I guess I'd say, 1950s TV show kind of mm -hmm. upbringing because they didn't have that. You know, they grew up in the yeah. 1950s and they had to deal with a lot of drama at their house. Um, so they kind of raised my younger brother and I in this idyllic uh, sort of uh, atmosphere. Um, unfortunately, what they didn't realize, and this will come into play with my addictions as we get further on in the story, um, I was taken care of by a woman who came very highly referred to them, who started taking care of me when I was about three months old uh, during the day when they were off at school teaching. Um, and uh, there was, as time went on, uh, there was a lot of inappropriateness and a lot of uh, just, you know, flat out mental abuse going on there. Right. Uh, right. So that, that had a lot to do with uh, forming who I was. Like I said, we can get into that as we move forward. Um, as far as a, a student goes, I was uh, expected to get good grades. Uh, my parents, I think, saw that to a degree as a bit of a status symbol since they were teachers within the school system. Uh, I was supposed to be almost a good representative of them. So I got very good grades. I participated in a lot of activities. I was a popular kid. Um, I was already into my addictions by 13, 14 years old, and I I very much at a young age learned how to hide who I was um, and not, not, not just hide who I was, 
but manipulate what people thought of me. And, you know, that's known in mental health circles as gaslighting. And from a very young age, I became a master manipulator, a master gaslighter. It's, you know, I recognize now when I was a kid for a while, I was very, very into magic. And I learned how to do these magic tricks. And I loved, uh, almost the con of it. I love the idea that I could make you think one thing was going on when something else was actually going on. And I never put it together until the last couple of years, but I think that really spoke to my personality back then was that it was safer for me as a person to make you think one thing was going on when something else was going on. I actually had the power. I had the control while you were being told a story that you believed. Uh, but like we said on the top of the show, uh, by all outside appearances, I was a very good student. I was a very happy student, active, popular. Uh, everything was, was, you know, going fine. I, uh, never really hit problems or never really deviated from the script my parents wrote for me until I went off to uh, university and almost immediately it, it just didn't work out for me. I dropped out of three schools within three years, but thankfully I discovered journalism at that point. I got hired at the local newspaper in my hometown um, and you know the rest was history there. I found something that I was very good at, ironically, telling stories. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, you know, that that was uh, where I really found my niche, where I found my stride. Uh, so I still don't have a degree, but thankfully they needed people to write. And I just kind of worked my way up through the system. OK, so it's really interesting because, like you say, you came from a household where there was no, you know, no alcohol, no drugs, no kind of drama, as you put it, where, where they, your parents had to deal with it, uh, no gambling. So you were completely uh, separated from those things as a child, but yet obviously you still leaned into towards uh, uh, you know drinking and addiction as you got a bit older. Um, so just before we go to sort of your teenage years, if you like, um, you mentioned the uh, the carer or the, the the I suppose you call it an au pair, would you, or like a yeah. the person who was looking after you? Yep. Um, and you said uh, that there was a lot of kind of like mental abuse there. Um, like how, how, what sort of age would you have been then when that was going on? Well, the stuff that I remember um, pretty much happened between about two and five years old. I don't remember anything specifically happening after I went to school, uh, but it was when I was with her during the days. Um, as far as... Um, Sex, I, I don't call what she did sexual abuse per se, although many people have told me I'm wrong, um, but there was a lot of sexual inappropriateness happening there, um, especially for kids. You know, she never had a problem having movies on that had lots of nudity. Um, oh, right, there was, she, she babysat other children. I remember uh, at one occasion she called my brother and I into a side room where she was diapering a two-year-old girl and just wanted us to look at her uh, genitals and actually had us touch her genitals to see that girls are built differently than boys. Mm. Uh, and uh, th But the mental abuse was what really was, uh, was rough there. Um, I remember one time, uh, this, this, was, this was really the toughest point, um, my brother on our way over to her house, he was just learning how to potty train. Uh, so I must have been about five, he was two and a half or so. Um, he wet his pants on the way over to her house. Um, shortly after my parents left, uh, she noticed this and she was uh, really a rotten person when it came to shaming people. So she made my brother strip from the waist down and she forced me and the two or three other kids that she was babysitting at that time to do one of these shame, 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 shame things for like five or six minutes. And I felt so, so horrible for my brother, but also for me being forced to do that, that I stopped. And then she started threatening me with violence and that she was going to do the same thing to me. Now, that's one of my, you know, worst memories. But there were times where, you know, I, I can look back now 
and recognized that she had some severe uh, OCD problems. For instance, she had no floors in her house. Everything was carpeted. Uh, and she would she would run the vacuum over her carpet uh, probably three, four times a day. And she would make me follow and pick up any tiny little spots on the floor, pieces of lint or any hair or anything she might have missed. She combed my hair mm, 10 to 15 times a day, you know, very rough. She most of the time called me George, even though my name is Josh. And I remember I asked her one time, you know, why do you do this? And she said, I just like the name George better. And me being, you know, three, four, five years old, whatever. Um, and then there was just, you know, there was there was times of neglect. If she got angry or she was having a rough day, she'd just, she had a bit of a large house. She just put all the kids in different rooms and shut the lights and leave you in there. And it might be 15 minutes or it might be two hours uh, that, you know, you'd just be kept in a dark room. Uh, if the if it was nice outside, she would make you go out, you know, at lunchtime, go out and play around, you know, 11 in the morning or noon. And I never saw the inside of the house again until my parents came and picked me up around five o'clock. And she really came and checked on us at all. Uh, and if we had to go to the bathroom, we learned pretty fast that uh, not to go ask her, not to bother her. So we would just, you know, f go over, you know, in the woods area where there, there was a little forest near her house. We just go to the bathroom there. And I remember, you know, my brother, uh, he had, you know, uh, potty training issues when he was a little kid. He would just go to the bathroom in his pants because he was so scared to go to the house and ask her to come inside and use the bathroom. So we lived really with a lot of fear. And that was where... I developed a lot of my coping mechanisms, a lot of my survival skills. I developed this ability to completely mentally detach from a situation. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I'm the kind of person I can go to the doctors. I can sit in the waiting room for an hour and it feels like five minutes because I can just turn it off in my head. I don't notice what's going on around me. I'm, I'm great on long car rides. It seems like it, it doesn't take any time to me because I've got this ability to detach. Um, I've also, you know, I've got this ability or not ability, but I learned to turn off my empathy when I was a kid, seeing horrible, you know, it, it was almost okay when horrible things happened to me, but to see horrible things happen to my little brother, to see horrible things happen to the other children who were there, the only thing that I could do was sort of develop this lack of empathy or learn to put up these walls um, and, and not feel something because it was just too bothersome for me. Uh, it was, you know, it was really rough. And I, I think that was the point where I adopted the... Uh, philosophy of just survive to the next day. Say whatever you have to say, do whatever you have to do, just survive to the next day, and you can deal with whatever crap is thrown your way then. But today, survive right now, get to the next day. And uh, unfortunately, you know, that, that was up until the very end with my addictions, uh, which we'll get to, that was the most scared I ever was in my life. I mean, I remember just being petrified uh, of, of everything at that point when I was at her home. Um, and that was really where I developed some of those maladjusted coping mechanisms uh, that later on in life, you know, popped back up and, and led to things going going astray. Yeah, I think the thing is as well is like obviously all of that sounds horrific, and I think kids adapt very quickly, particularly young kids of that age group which you're talking sort of two, three, four, five, is if it's bad bad things or things they're scared of or if things hurt them it does you know it can bother them and they can have nightmares and things like this but they do adapt to yeah coping mechanisms they find ways to get through whatever is happening and you hear it all the time about how strong children are you know because they seem to be able to just take things in their stride obviously for you i think by the sounds of it and obviously we're going to get into it now is the effects of that, you know, at the time, it was obviously very scary, very frightening, not very pleasant at all. And then the real kind of after effects of it took place as you went into your sort of teenage years. Um, so 
where what, what age were you when you sort of started drinking uh i had you know like i think a lot of kids taken a sip here or there when i had been at uh a relative's house who had alcohol um my parents because of their upbringing with with you know all, all four of their parents were alcoholics and uh their point of view was very extreme with alcohol. Uh, they basically led me to believe that if I ever took a sip of alcohol, it would be only minutes before I'm laying in the gutter, you know, almost like a Bugs Bunny cartoon holding a bottle with two X's on it and, you know, a complete drunk who was homeless and lost his life. And I think when I was, you know, 11, 12 years old and I started sneaking a few sips here and there, uh, I, I liked it, and I don't know that I ever really caught a buzz when I was 11 or 12, but it made me, I came to a realization that this isn't killing me instantly, like my parents made me believe it would. So uh, the first time I ever got truly drunk, I was 13 or 14 years old. I was at a wedding uh, for a cousin of mine, and they had a lot of tables there where they, the caterers had already pre-poured champagne at the tables, and not every table had people at it. So during the wedding, when you know, during the reception, when nobody was paying attention, I would just walk around and drink the champagne. It taste, tasted great to me. It was like a sparkling cider. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, two or three or four or five, and suddenly for the first time, I'm starting to feel really loose and really good, and I'm dancing up a storm and having a good time. And I put it together that, you know, this stuff has made me feel better, and not just better, but better about myself than almost anything I've ever tried. You know, I don't know what my parents are afraid of. This stuff is the answer for a lot of my anxiety, for a lot of my fears, for a lot of the negative stuff in my life. This makes me feel good. Why don't more people know about this? Why aren't more people doing this? Because this stuff is fantastic. Yeah, and I think the thing is as well then, is in that position, you're 13, you're not old enough and mature enough emotionally to understand that, you know, I shouldn't do this every day, all the time. But like you say, you found this thing as well, which suddenly has made you feel good. So all those negative emotions and feelings that you've been through up to that point, you feel like you've found almost like a solution to that just in that brief moment of a couple of hours of having a few drinks and getting getting drunk for the first time. Do you feel that the the lack of alcohol in your household and maybe the kind of rural area contributed to you then sort of becoming a drink, you know, a heavy drinker well, and alcoholic? Um, I think what it contributed to was that it gave me the mindset that like alcohol was a treat. Um, when I was able to get my hands on it, it was something special. You know, I, I didn't have, uh, or, or put it this way, um, we, ate, we ate pizza in my house two or three nights a week. Pizza was not something special. Um, one of the first girls I dated in high school when I was 15 or 16, her family got pizza like once a month. And when they got it, her brothers and sisters acted like it was the greatest thing in the world. And I'm like, it's just pizza. And yeah. I think that's kind of the way it was with alcohol, where since I didn't have it in the house, I didn't have easy access to it. Not only did it make me feel good, but I was already romanticizing it as this kind of special treat. So when I was, you know, 15, 16, 17, and I started working, um, you know, I made friends with people who would go and buy me alcohol when I when I needed them to. I think I was I think I was 16 when I discovered a store and. Uh, uh, the drinking age over here is 21. Um, you know, I was 16 when I discovered a store that would sell it to me. So from that point forward, I had no problems getting my hands on it. But it was always because there it wasn't at my house because it was always kind of a sneaky thing uh, because yeah. I had to never appear like I had any for my parents. Um, it was almost a game too. I've always been attracted, or my personality type is one that's been drawn to um, getting away with something. Like I said, it's it's magic. It's the con. It's gaslighting. You know, there's a little a little piece of me uh, liked 
the fact I was getting away with something. My parents don't want me to drink while well, I'm drinking, and I'm actually enjoying it. I'm having a good time. Um, I don't know what their problem is with it, but this is good for me, and it, it makes it all the better that it's a sneaky thing, which, you know, in retrospect is kind of a weird pathology, uh, but that's, that's kind of the, the way it was for me. Yeah, it's, it's, it's interesting to me because, um, like, the drinking side of your story up to now is very similar to mine in that I think I was, like, there was alcohol in the house and my my extended family drunk. So there, I wasn't, there was no alcohol around, but I wasn't, my parents weren't kind of like, some parents I know they would let their kids have a little sip of wine or something with food to introduce them to alcohol, maybe to introduce them to drinking it responsibly, or maybe just because they drink a lot and they just say, or oh, like try that sort of thing, just to sip with your food or whatever it may be. Whereas when I was about, I think probably about 13 or 14, I raided my mother's liquor cabinet or drinks cabinet as you like because they'd go gone out shopping with my younger brother and me and one of my older friends went in the cabinet and got drunk on liqueurs first time i'd ever drunk any alcohol and i was drinking like a 50 percent proof something or other i was not very well um i got i ended up being sick and lying in the middle of the road upside the shop and i got brought home by the police and my parents were mortified i was in bed for days but after that, that did, you know, once I got through the the initial three or four day hangover and being sick and ill and all that, the the ongoing kind of danger of going to the shop and getting you know, either getting to buy and getting someone to buy you the beers and the alcohol or finding a shop which would serve you. I can relate to that a lot because that's what I did and that's what I did throughout my sort of childhood until I was able to look old enough to get served in a pub. Um, so obviously in the UK, it's, you have to be 18 to drink. But, if, you know, 14, 15, 16, 17, I was looking for shops which would serve me or finding people who could get served. Um, so I can certainly relate, you know, to that aspect of it. Um, so after you got drunk that that first time at about 13, did you kind of just drink from then on like as in i don't mean did you just instantly become an alcoholic but i mean did you regularly drink alcohol after that or was it a kind of gradual thing it, it was gradual um i think the first time i was able to find somebody outside a store was uh near ironically near a video store where i would rent pornographic films mm -hmm. uh at 14 years old and i found somebody who if i gave him 20 dollars, he'd buy me a six pack he'd take one of the beers and he'd keep the rest of the money and so you know i'm riding my bike because i still don't have my driver's license you know at 14 i'm riding my bike home uh with porn and beer in my backpack um and from that point forward, I didn't drink every day. And sometimes I'd only have, you know, my, my tolerance was low. So two or three beers would give me the desired effect. Um, I, ironically, uh, co contrasting your story, I never actually got sick off drinking until I was probably about 18 years old. I led myself to believe that um, I my body chemistry was somehow different than everybody else's and i didn't get you know crazy drunk but i generally only stuck to beer and once i got buzzed at least the first four or five years of my drinking i tended to stop i tended to stop i just i wanted to catch that buzz and keep that kind of constant buzz going for hours but i never brought it too far beyond until yeah. I was till I was 18 or 19 and then you know at that point I kind of went off the deep end and you know f discovered uh hard alcohol and uh you know uh the harder spirits and that was when I started getting sick that was when I started getting you know uh you know more much more of a hardcore drinking problem uh but my first four or five years um like I said it was something that soothed me I did I I you know, there is no drinking a 15 year old should do. So, you know, one sip is using to excess, but I don't think a lot of people would describe it as 
overuse or no. a real addiction at that point. I loved it. It was a bad habit, but I don't think it was it was quite addictive at that point. That was that was I guess what you'd call the the early warning signs that I'd have a problem, but it didn't actually enter addiction until my later teens. Yeah, I mean, it, you know, look, if you just cut this part of the story and what I said, you'd have the majority of men now would probably say, yeah, around, you know, 13 to 16, 17. That's what we were doing, trying to get beer from a shop, trying to get someone to get served. And even the porn side of it as well, you know, people can would relate to that and say, oh, yeah, we were doing that. Or, you know, there was groups of us trying to get beer. Um, but obviously, in your case, you went from, like you said, just having a few beers and not going too far sorry um going too far and then that obviously that progressed to 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 other issues so you you said you think you were about sort of at 17 18 really when you first started to sort of progress from maybe say just drinking a few beers to to drinking heavily was there anything kind of in your life which changed at that point did you move move out from home or Exactly. That was when I first started going off to college and off to university. And my experiences, and like I said, I dropped out of three in three years. Uh, my experiences with going to, you know, that uh, higher education just didn't click with me. I've, I've, despite the fact my parents are educators, despite the fact that I got very good grades in school, uh, school and I have never clicked. I'm the kind of guy, I don't want to go to college to learn to be a journalist and spend four years doing that. I want to just go start writing, start working, and you know, I'd rather spend eight years figuring out how to do something on my own than be schooled in it for four years. And yeah. like I said, I started working, I actually started working my last year of high school at the local newspaper. And uh, I would come home from breaks in, in college and work, and I'd work all summer at the newspaper writing stories. And every time I'd go to school, I'd take journalism classes, and I'd just be sitting there, what am I spending all this money on to get the job I already have? Why am I wasting time at school? I should be out there writing stories right now. And th that's just, that's who I've been. That's who I've always been is that, um, I want to do things my way. And when I'm forced to do things a different way, that's that's a lot of stress for me. That's a lot of anxiety for me. And every time I went to school and just couldn't adapt to that culture and couldn't adapt to that lifestyle, you know, that was that was what my parents wanted for me, not what I wanted for me. So anytime I was in that school environment, I started drinking a lot more. And then I would come home and during the school year, any friends that I had were off at the universities. So I wasn't you know, I didn't have my regular friends. I developed friendships with people at the newspaper. And by this time, I'm 17, 18, 19. Um, they're all older than me. And I was, you know, very mature. And like I said, I could manipulate, I could play roles. And I was acted as a very mature, uh, uh, older teenager. Most people told me they thought I was 25, 26 when I was 19 years old. Uh, so I started and I could get into uh, the pubs and the bars locally at that point, you know, after work with them. So I started drinking with an adult crowd as well um, and having it be more of a social thing. It had always been kind of hidden on my own. And so that was the first time it became social. And, you know, I'd drink two or three pints with them at the end of a work day. Then I'd go home and have, you know, two or three more at my house. And that was where the drinking started to, uh, I wanted to just kind of keep the party going. I wanted to keep that good feeling going. And that was when I started to wake up in the morning with headaches or occasionally if I did too much, you know, get sick, uh, off of the alcohol. So do you think at that point, it, um, you're drinking there is sounds as if it's not you know it's it's probably too much but it's not um excessive to a point where you know you're you're being ill all the time or you're drinking from the morning to night it sounds like you would you know have some drinks with people after work and then you would just because you'd had a couple of drinks you'd want to have a couple more drinks at home so at that point it doesn't seem or it doesn't sound correct me if i'm wrong as if it's 
developed into a huge issue at that point? No, no, it was it was a crutch for me at that point. It was the uh, you know it was something that made me feel good, and and I know we'll get into it, but the, you know simultaneously I also had the pornography issue. Um, you know these played in tandem. Um, no, I, I I guess I would say at this point I didn't have a lot of the true stressors of adult life i hadn't gone off and you know uh tried to start any businesses on my own yet at that point i i wasn't necessarily escaping from a life that was too difficult for me at that point i hadn't started using alcohol in that way yet okay so you're working at the newspaper um did you so when you've been kicked out of the three schools that's more to do with... Well, I, I left on my own. I, yeah, I wasn't oh, kicked. Sorry. Um, so when you've left the three the three schools, that's more uh, because you weren't enjoying it and it wasn't fitting with what you wanted to do as a, rather than you not being able to do it because you were drinking at that point. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, up until the point that I was, you know, 2021, 20, I hated being around people my own age. Going back to being a kid, I always... Uh, acted more mature. I always found uh, f- adult conversation far more interesting. I thought most of the kids my own age were idiots and morons, and their the things that they liked and the things that they wanted to pursue were not what I wanted to. Um, you know, it, it wasn't until I was an adult that I actually liked being around people my own age. Um, okay. You know, just just uh, ne- never really clicked with kids, even when I was a kid. Yeah, so I and I suppose because you were hanging around with uh, older people, you you got into social drinking earlier than perhaps what you would have if you know if you were in college and you were going to school, you wouldn't have had that social aspect of it after work and stuff like that because you were drinking with you know people who were twenty two, twenty three, or whatever. Well, and in college, when I was in college, you know, I went to a few college parties and I hated them. I don't like, and I I don't like going to a pub or I didn't like going to a pub on a Friday or Saturday night when it was overly packed and you're like this and you're, Mm. you know, you spend 20 minutes trying to order a a drink from the, from the bartender and you know, it's too loud and it's packed. That's, that's never been my scene. I'm not comfortable in that. I am claustrophobic. I, you know, I, I'm, I'm. It's it's just not me, you know. I I go to a concert. I sit in the back because I like my space, uh, and I like yeah. to be able to I like to be able to hear the person next to me. Um, so uh, you know, I, I did experience that typical twenty twenty one year old college life um, and that culture, and it just turned me off. I the the way that they drank as regular you know twenty twenty one year olds. I wanted no piece of that. There was nothing enjoyable about that. Alcohol wasn't an escape from that. It was it was just something that all these people did, and I I couldn't relate to uh, enjoying that experience. Yeah, and I guess at that point you had had or you had been drinking even though not heavily in terms of it being a problem you had been drinking since you were 13 so you'd been drinking for a good few years before that whereas perhaps some of these uh kids in college were were drinking for the first time so they and they you know they want to go to parties and they want to drink heavily and this that and the other whereas you're at a point where you're just still drinking you know to have a few beers and kind of do your thing if you like rather than just drinking for the sake of it as college kids do oh and what what was ironic is that you know in my uh second or third attempt at college i was i was put with kids who were younger than me because i never got through my first year completely and by my you know second or third attempt at college i knew i didn't want to go to those parties so on friday night i'd be sitting in my room watching movies uh or you know the internet had just came out i'd be on america online or or uh prodigy or whatever it was at the time uh and just drinking on my own and around you know midnight 1 a.m these kids who have never had any drinks before would come back completely just blasted and it was i was almost the one who was seen as the adult who knew how to handle things you know and i i i was somebody who made sure that you know they (laughs) 
they were brought to the bathroom and put in front of a toilet or that if they you know passed out that they weren't sleeping on their back or or on their stomach that they were on their side you know people came and looked to me <laughs> almost as the wise guru of drinking because i'd been there and done that at that point and i'd seen it enough times and you know i didn't go off to these parties i think they saw me almost as the adult at that point yeah, that's, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because, like like I said, at this point, it doesn't seem like your drinking was necessarily a problem. Obviously, that's not the case as things progress. Where was the 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 change, do you think, from just where you were there, where you were social drinking, drinking, you know, drinking on your own, obviously, isn't ideal, but it, you know. The first time was when I, that I, 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 think it became a full-on problem was when I took a job in Japan. Um, there was a English language newspaper in Tokyo and it was uh, geared towards the US military, uh, the, the people who were serving over there. And the staff of the newspaper, it was about one-third American uh, civilians, one-third American military, and one-third Japanese civilians. And during is a very major thing in Japanese culture, especially in the big cities. And I learned very fast uh, that the people I liked the best were the Japanese citizens. So after uh, what was a kind of funny story is that I became friends with this group of women. Now, like I said, I'm 22. These women are in their late 30s, early 40s. They started bringing me to karaoke with them after work. Mm -hmm. And karaoke over there is just, it's its almost like hotel rooms. It's just you and, and these people in a small room. It's not done in a giant bar. They liked bringing me because I could pronounce the words of American songs better than they could. So even though I have a horrible, horrible singing voice, I was able to make the songs sound more familiar to them. And its it was a little bit embarrassing for me. So they just started giving me lots of beer. And it made me feel great. And eventually they would go off, uh, go to their homes or whatever. Sometimes one would hang around and I would end up going to a bar with them or, or there was a lot of pubs around where I was living. I was basically living in the most densely populated part of Tokyo. Uh, when you see New York City on TV, there's Times Square, uh, which is where the ball drops for New Year's Eve. And yeah. it's, it's the epicenter of New York City. I was living in the Tokyo version of that called Rapungi. And 22 years old, liking to drink, I would, you know, after, after we finished karaoke, I'd go out and have dinner because I was by myself. And I got to know all the people at these different bars. They became my friends. So every night I'd be out and there was no last call. Here in the United States, uh, one o'clock hits, bars close. Well, that doesn't happen in Tokyo. Bars stay open. And me being a 22-year-old who probably, you know, who's abroad for the first time, who as an American, I'm kind of treated like a celebrity in, in Japan because I'm unique and I'm exotic. Um, I would drink till three, four in the morning, and then I'd have to be at work at 6 a.m. So I would go home and I'd just, you know, try to take a shower quickly, try to catch two hours of sleep, and then head off to work. And I did this month after month, and I was in Tokyo for about six, seven months, and it got to the point where I wouldn't go back to my room and go to sleep or anything. I would actually just go straight to work from the bars. And essentially go to work drunk because that was so much fun. And for my first time, my work wasn't for fun. It was, I had a lot of trouble adjusting to that type of newsroom. And, and I won't get into all the differences between yeah. the one I was in, but it was a very different work culture than I was used to. And it was, I just couldn't assimilate. And that was the first time I was, you know, I'm 22 years old, I'm by myself. I'm on the other side of the world from everything I know. I'm, I'm functionally illiterate because I can't read any signs uh, or, you know, and, and I didn't speak a word of Japanese. So it was a very, very stressful, difficult time. It was the first time that I started, you know, drinking heavy. And the end of my time there, I was supposed to be there about eight months, six, six and a half months in, um, I showed up or I didn't show up for work. I was so drunk. I just went back to my room and passed out. Um, the next morning I showed up at work and my boss pulled me into a room and said, you know, we know you're showing up for 
work drunk every day, but you're getting your work done. So we haven't said anything and we know you only have two months left. So we haven't said anything. However, you didn't even call into work yesterday. So we've made the decision that we're going to let you go and you have to be out of Japan within 48 hours because I was there under a special visa granted by the uh, United States Department of Defense. And they told me I had 48 hours to leave. So essentially, I was kicked out of Japan because mm -hmm. of my drinking. Yeah. And that that's really the first, I didn't, I didn't see it at the time, but I look back now and that's really the first major red flag that I was developing a drinking problem. And when things would get too stressful, my drinking would go off the charts. Yeah, and the thing is, like you say, because you were in a foreign country, because you were alone, you went out every night and you drink every night. And then it becomes, like you say, two hours sleep, one hour sleep, no sleep, just go straight to work. And then, like you say, don't go to work. Um, so you left Japan. I would imagine when looking back on it, you must think it was almost like a slide indoors thing because... When you come back from Japan, then there's obviously the option to not not keep drinking every day and not keep getting blasted every day. Not because obviously in Japan you had almost that excuse of I don't know anyone, I don't speak the language, I'm in a foreign country on my own, I'm I'm there for only eight months. So you've come home. Did you drink? Did your drinking slow down, or did it get worse, or did you just carry not on the party? Yeah, no, uh, it, it didn't get better at first because I had a uh, I had an American girlfriend for about a year, year and a half before I left for Japan. We kept our relationship together while I was there, and I came back and started living with her in her apartment. Uh, in Japan, I made great money, especially for a twenty two year old. Um, it's the it's kind of money that you know I didn't see for another ten fifteen years after that, and. Mm. I was able to save a lot of it while I was there. So I came back from Japan, I think with something like twelve, thirteen thousand $13,000 in my bank account. So I didn't have to run off and get a job. My girlfriend was still a student at the local university. And at night, she worked at a pub as a bartender. So the only chance for me to see her was to go down at the, uh, you know, when she was working her shift and sit at the bar and talk to her. And I had plenty of money that I didn't have to go get a job. I could pay half the rent and, you know, we didn't have a lot of expenses. So yeah, the, uh, you know, I wouldn't say the party necessarily continued, but I would go and sit at her, sit at the bar starting around seven or eight at night and probably have seven or eight beers until she got off her shift. Uh, she always had to drive me home at night. I walked down to the bar um, because I was just too intoxicated yeah. and I had no... Uh, I had no drive to go find a job at that point. I was perfectly fine with sleeping late in the morning and watching the game shows on TV and uh, going out and drinking at night so I could see her. And that kept up for several months until she actually broke up with me. And that was kind of a kick in the pants that I needed to get back into journalism, to go find a real job and continue on with my life. And, you know, really at that point, over the next... Uh, I, I met my wife probably three or four years later, and over the next 10, 12 years, as we had kids, as we bought a house, uh, there was times where I might not drink for a week or two at a time. But then when a stress would hit, you know, something, the the uh, hot water heater blows up and I don't have $500 to replace it today. I'm not getting paid till the end of the week. Uh, so we don't have hot water for three or four days. That's when some of the stressors of the real world would hit me. Or, you know, I got in trouble at work or something. That's when I think I really started using over those next 10, 12 years, using alcohol as the crutch, using yeah. alcohol as I need to escape this horrible crap that's hitting me in life right now. I, I can't cope. I can't deal. Yeah. So let me go and get those beers. Let me go and get a bottle of tequila. And that's when, you know, like I said, it, it was an ongoing thing. It was a thing that developed that, uh, 
again, I wasn't out partying every night. You know, I was sitting at home drinking and getting myself absolutely, absolutely blotto because uh, I would drink half a bottle of tequila a night. I would drink 10, 12 beers a night when I did. Uh, and it was, it absolutely uh, was my crutch and, and turned into uh, my crutch. And I, aside from my wife and my parents to a degree, nobody really knew that I had that alcohol problem. Yeah, so obviously, when you, when anyone, I've done it myself, is when you turn, when you can't cope with something, whether it's just whatever sort of stress or upset, and your first thing is to turn to, to drinking, it's a problem because, you know, life is full of stresses and issues and, you know, everything from day to day pain to arguments and whatever you know kids everything bills money and if you're dependent on alcohol or drugs or anything like that it's it becomes a massive problem because you the more you every time you turn to it and it makes you feel better you turn to it again the next time because it made you feel better the last time but you drink more right well, certainly that's what i did anyway so it becomes this growing thing then because it always makes you feel better at the time. The next day, you always feel worse than the time before. At least I did. Um, but you, like you say, you're still functioning, still going to work, still, you know, still doing all the day to day things that you needed to do, even though you were drinking, uh, you know, heavily. Was there? Do you think was your wife aware that you had a, an, you know, an issue with alcohol, a problem with it? She knew that I drank a bit too much. Uh, she actually had a father who drank too much. Um, but I think that her point of view was as long as I was doing it at home, as long as I wasn't out, uh, you know, hitting on women, as long as I wasn't out driving home drunk, uh, it was more acceptable. You know, yeah. I was I was at home. A lot of it happened after she went to bed at night. Um, I'm, I've always been a you know big night owl. Um, it, it and as long as I kept my professional life together, and as long as I was a decent father and a decent husband, uh, she I think she felt like she didn't have too much to complain about. Yeah, I and I I can certainly I can understand that because if you're if you're out drinking every night, you could drink, say you, you could have been drinking less, but going to a bar every night to unwind and she doesn't know where you are or she doesn't know what you're doing. Whereas at home, you might be drinking a lot more and stronger, you know, tequila rather than beers. But she knows you're just downstairs and she knows you're, you know, you're at home and you're going to work tomorrow and you get up and you, you know, get the kids ready for school and you go to you go to work on time. It it seems like less less of a problem then, doesn't it? Because it's not technically uh, affecting day to day life because you're able to function and you know do everything you need to do as a husband, as a father, as you know as an employee. When so did you ever uh, did you get treatment for your drinking? before everything else happened no no so everything came together to yeah. a big head I, and i i didn't i didn't even uh accept that i was an alcoholic until everything happened right okay so obviously we've we've both mentioned it at different points throughout where we've been talking um but you were also a, a, a addicted to pornography Correct. um so if we just quickly sort of flip back to when you were uh, I think you said about 13. Um, how did you first come across, you know, pornography? Obviously, I know you mentioned uh, the lady who look at, looked after you. So obviously you had quite an early introduction to uh, seeing naked people on the TV, say. Right, than right. what other people would have. Right. Um, you know, sh she never had hardcore pornography around. Yeah, no, of course. The first time, first time I saw hardcore pornography, I was uh, 11 or 12 years old. My cousin, um, he uh, claimed to me that he had stolen three or four magazines from a store, um, and they were, 
a penthouse or hustler or whatever it was. Um, but it was the first time that I saw hardcore pornography. I actually saw intercourse and sex uh, mm. depicted on the pages of a magazine. And I'll tell you, even though I didn't get drunk for the first time until two or three years later, um, I had the same reaction as when I got drunk the first time. It was just like, oh my goodness, I have just found something here that speaks to me in a way and makes me feel good. And this is this didn't involve masturbation. This didn't involve, it, it was just looking at it. This is something I have discovered that is special. This is something that is, it's like the hallelujah chorus starts playing that, oh my goodness, I now have something that I can go to to make me feel good. This I there's something going on in my body, in my mind that is making me feel better than I have ever felt looking at this stuff. Um, I couldn't describe it then. Um, it's still a little weird to try to figure out what was going on because it was like I say, it was a chemical reaction in my head. I think, um, and from people say we well, you know they know from day one when they're an addict. I knew from day one seeing hardcore pornography, I knew from day one when I got drunk at that wedding that I was an alcoholic. And when I hear people say, you know, porn addiction isn't real, it was so the same experience with alcohol that it was with porn that, you know, I, I tell those people, you know, you're very lucky that you can have the ignorance of not experiencing it because I did. And I know that, you know, addiction is addiction is addiction. You talked earlier about needing to, you know, go from beer to uh, tequila or having to drink five beers, then six, then seven. And that's because your dopamine receptors get used to things and you build a tolerance and you always build that tolerance with addictions. And, uh, you know, the day that I saw hardcore pornography, just regular naked people on TV or anything that, that didn't really do it for me ever yeah. again after that. Um, I didn't see a lot of porn over the next two or three years um, until I was able to start renting videos at that store by my house. But uh, yeah, I, I knew the day it happened. Oh my goodness, this is something. I, I couldn't have told you it was addiction then. I couldn't tell you what it was, but something clicked in a way that only a few years later, alcohol clicked similar. Joshua, thank you ever so much for joining me. Uh, guys, you can check out uh, Joshua's website and his books and all the links which I'll put in the description of the episode. I'll also put links to addiction charities, mental health charities in the uh, in the description, sorry. And um, if you've been affected by anything we've discussed within the show, I'm sure Joshua would be happy for you to reach out to him to, to ask any questions, to talk Absolutely. to him. As always, my uh, my messages are always open. My email is available, and you can contact me. And I can I can't really give you solid medical advice because I'm not qualified, but I can give you an ear to listen, and I can point you in the right, right direction. And I will always try to do that. Uh, you can find me on Twitter at AceCast underscore nation, Facebook.com slash AceCast nation. And as always, you can find all our shows, for all the different series and subjects on uh, video versions at YouTube.com slash Ace Podcast Nation or audio versions at all the usual podcasting sites and apps. Guys, we'll uh, see you for the next episode. <laughs>